Hi, welcome to another episode of The Art of Physics. Minion Improbable has worked very hard to obtain our guest for today's program, and I want to give MI some overdue credit. Good work. You're getting closer to Cosmo's ship of imagination every day. What's that? <laughs> Sorry, but I'm afraid your communication skills aren't quite ready for prime time yet. <laughs> uh, I still don't get it. Well, whatever, we're going to move along. Uh, today we're going to start with Robert Hooke, uh, and we're going to talk to him about gravitation. Welcome, sir. I have no idea where we are, and I am a member of the Royal Society and a doctor of physic. But I was not knighted, so please just call me Master Hook. Uh, very well, Master Hook. Um, we're here on TV to talk to you about some of the ideas from your career. Whatever t TV might be, I've had many people question me over many years. I suppose you want to hear about my microscope, but let me tell you a few more things as well. That would be fine. In 1635, I was born on the Isle of Wight. I was the youngest of four. My father and two uncles were all ministers. They expected me to become a cleric also, but that wasn't the case. So what did happen? Well, I wasn't very healthy as a child, and I was homeschooled. I had some mechanical aptitude and loved to take apart clocks and put them back together. I also enjoyed drawing and painting. And when I was 13, my father died, and I used my inheritance to go to London and become an apprentice clockmaker. Prior to my apprenticeship, I proved quite adept at school, and I gave up my tradesmen ideas to enter Oxford at the age of 18. Ah, Oxford. So that's where your scientific work started. Well, not quite right away. First, I learned to play the organ, marvelous instrument. Then I met Robert Boyle and began to assist him in his work on gases. We were quite successful, and I played a critical role in formulating Boyle's law. Would you like to see the mathematics of it? Uh, this is not the art of mathematics, I'm sorry. Uh, can we just move on? I'm actually more interested in your work on gravity. Well, that came a little later, and it had some pretty upsetting aspects. First, let me tell you that the Royal Society was formed just after my work with Robert Boyle, and I was made Master of Experiments. Wasn't the Royal Society a group of England's best scientists who made many discoveries and advances? Oh, quite so. Early on, my personal research centered on springs. Most springs in them, their deflection is directly proportional to the force applied to them. That is now called Hooke's Law. And I used this to design balance springs and escapement wheels for watches. Wow, that must have brought you some great fame. Yes, and some contention. Christian Huygens claimed to have discovered it first, and that fool Olenberg horned in also. That must have been quite a distraction for you. Of course, but it didn't deter me. I worked with my microscope and published drawings of my observations of many things that hadn't been clearly seen before. The book was a huge success. You must have been delighted. Whatever I felt was short-lived. London was devastated, not only by the plague, but the great London fire of 1666 burned much of the city to the ground. Well, that's horrible. Oh, certainly was, but we did our best to bounce back. I used my surveyor skills to help Christopher Wren to plan for the city's rebuilding. Through all this, I suppose your scientific work was also proceeding? Oh, that never stopped. I worked on the force that attracts bodies together, gravity. I knew all about it, but then that upstart Newton came along. Uh, uh-oh. There appears to be an insect on the set. You must remove it before I enter. Uh.
Oh, I'm beginning to see what's happening here. Master Hook, we seem to be experiencing some technical difficulties right now. So could you please return to the green room for a few moments? Uh, we'll send someone for you as soon as we get it resolved. Certainly. I'm known for my cooperative nature. Uh, Minion, uh, would you please get our next guest? Oh, good. You're ready for me. It's so confusing here, I could have sworn I saw a dreadful person from my past. No matter, it's good to be here. Those devices you see in front of you are sending our conversation for many people to view and hear. They're very interested in what you have to say. I'm happy to tell you my story. Should we start with my birth on Christmas Day, 1642? Sounds like a great beginning. Actually, I had a most unfortunate start to my life. My father had died several months before my premature birth, and I was so small that my mother said I would fit into a quart pot. Wow, where were you born? My family owned a good-sized farm called Woolsthorpe in Lincolnshire. When I was three, my mother married a clergyman, Barnabas Smith, and moved to his house two miles away. So you moved when you were still quite young. Not me. Only my mother moved. I stayed in Woolsthorpe under the care of my Askew grandparents. Huh, that sounds like the beginning of a difficult childhood. Well, not really. I had the run of the place and happily built sundials and clocks. When I was 11, Master Smith and my grandfather Askew both died. So mother moved back to Woolsthorpe along with my new half-siblings. Wasn't it about time for you to go to school? At 12, I started the King's School at Grantham. It was far away from home, so I boarded there. Oh, so from there, you must have gone to Cambridge. Not directly. First, mother sent for me so I could learn to run the family farm. I hated it. So I mostly built clocks, read books, and avoided mother. Finally, Uncle William Askew persuaded her to allow me to attend his alma mater, Trinity College, Cambridge. Ah, Cambridge, so you finally made the big time. Yes, but it was disappointing at first. They mostly focused on Aristotle, but his work was so out of date. I supplemented my studies with the more modern ideas of Descartes, Galileo, and Kepler. It became quite interesting, but I had more questions than, answered than answers which I carefully noted. Then disaster struck. Just after I achieved my bachelor's, the Great Plague struck, and Cambridge was shut down indefinitely. Oh boy, so what did you do? Well, with a certain amount of trepidation, I returned to Woolsthorpe. I feared Mother would try again to make a farmer of me, but she surprised me by allowing me to work on my intellectual pursuits. I was able to work on the questions I'd set forth at Cambridge, and I developed some original ideas on mathematics, optics, motions of bodies, and gravitation. It was a very productive time. Wow. Were there apple trees on your farm? There are stories about an apple falling off a tree and hitting you on the head uh, from which you develop your theory of gravitation. I was a good enough farmer to dodge falling apples, <laughs> but I certainly did note that they all fell straight down, never sideways or upwards. After all, almost two years, classes resumed, so I returned to Cambridge to work on my master's. Professor Isaac Barrow, first Lucasian professor of natural science, was mightily impressed with the work I did at home. In short order, I finished my master's. Professor Barrow left to become the king's chaplain, and he recommended me for his position. Wow, things really began to move fast for you then. They did, but the Royal Society had several contentious fellows in its membership, and I was reluctant to publish much of my work for fear of controversy or criticism. The fuss would have distracted me from my work. And besides, I had little money to spend on printing. It wasn't until much later that my astronomer friend, Edmund Haley, approached me about the details of how gravitation applies to heavenly bodies, such as comets, that I finally set down my ideas about motion and gravitation in final form, and he paid for the printing. <clears throat> Just a moment here. I knew about gravity long before your Principia of 1687. Oh, 
The insect hallucination is back, stronger than ever. I must go. I'm no illusion, Isaac. Why don't you stay and face the music? You know I thought of gravity first. Now you're the hallucinating one, Robert. First, what about Galileo, Aristotle, or even Brahmagupta? They all speculated about gravity way before you did. Mm, so you admit others thought of gravity before you. Thought of? Don't you recall the letter I sent you? I clearly stated that I'd seen Father because I stood on the shoulders of giants. All of them, including you, had thoughts. But ideas without a mathematical formulation is like a steak and kidney pie without the steak. Where was your mathematics? Oh, I knew mathematics when you were still an apple farmer, but I was too busy to work out the details. I leave those to the worker bees. Then that's where the credit should go. Science needs complete theories that include mathematical details, not just half-baked ideas. And another thing. After I died, my portrait that hung in the Royal Society office suddenly went missing. The rumor is that you had it removed. And that's a low blow, Isaac. Rumors? What do you know of rumors? After you died, I became president of the Royal Society, and we moved our offices. I had all the portraits taken down, including yours and mine, for the move. But then you didn't have it put back up. Well, look at your face, Robert. Do you think I'd gaze upon that grumpy countenance every time I came into the office? It was stored in a closet along with several others. Hmm, I suppose I might have done the same thing if the situation were reversed. You had grown quite corpulent and you never would have won any Mr. Congeniality contest. Now, gentlemen, these events were long ago and far away. We're reaching a family audience here, and I'd like you to promise me that you'll set an example for the youth of today and declare a truce, please? Suppose you're right. We need to be adults here, I suppose. <sighs> Very well, I will promise to. It's much to your credit that you two have promised to declare a truce. Now, please smile for the camera. Oh, it's like that. I guess the quote for the day is the title of the famous play from their countryman, William Shakespeare. All's well that ends well. Until next time, I'm Art Wiggins. Mm -hmm.